We humans often like to think we're the end of the line when it comes to evolution. But if we rewind through our short time on Earth as a species, and the many changes that have occurred to us along the way, we find we're still very much a work in progress. Evolution at its most basic level is a change in gene frequency over time. So anyone who says we've stopped evolving is crazy. Evolution is occurring every time someone has a child. We may not always have been aware of it, but we humans have been tampering with our genes ever since our species arose on the plains of Africa some 200,000 years ago, changing and adapting to new conditions as we spread across the globe. But geneticists like Spencer Wells say that for the last 10,000 years or so, humans have been accelerating otherwise gradual changes at an unprecedented rate. We're, we're definitely fast-tracking evolution. And it seems we may be just getting started. For the last 30 years, geneticists have been engaged in a massive global effort to chart genetic changes across the human family. From outward changes in skin, hair, and eye color, to physiological ones that determine fitness for different climates, or the ability to digest various foods. Everybody's DNA is carrying a story inside of it. It's the story of your ancestry, and it takes you back to the story of human origins, the story of all of us. Scientists first began using DNA to tell this story in the 1980s and 90s, starting with mitochondrial DNA, passed down by moms. Then the Y chromosomes, passed down by dads, they were able to map out lines of human descent, tracing them back to single individuals, scientific Adam and Eve. To do it back then, they needed DNA from very special groups of people. It turns out that the people who provide kind of the clearest signposts for our understanding of the details of how our species migrated around the planet are the people who've lived in particular locations for a long period of time. These are the world's indigenous people. They've lived in the same place for hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of years. Which means their DNA has been relatively isolated from the moving and mixing that has altered most of the rest of our DNA over the last few centuries. By comparing to these groups that have lived in the same place and have been relatively removed from, you know, the mixing that's happened in the last few hundred years, you can place people into a deeper context, um, a deeper historical context. The key takeaway from this massive effort to map historical human migration patterns boils down to one simple, if mind-boggling, finding. No matter how scattered we are, no matter how unique we may appear, our genetic markers trace back to one place and one relatively small group of people who lived in Africa as recently as 60,000 years ago. Our eyes, skin, hair, height, and all of the other features that have now come to define us, rather superficially, into what we call race, have come about relatively recently only after our ancestors embarked on their great migration around the globe and were forced to evolve in order to adapt to new conditions. All of these forces have led us to look different. We have changed over time and we will continue to change moving into the future. We're much more closely related genetically than anybody would have suspected before the DNA came along. That's a really cool story. It's about the unity of humanity. It's a story that didn't end once our ancestors reached the ends of the earth. Thanks to more recent advances in gene technology, Wells and an increasing number of scientists are learning not just when and where our differences arose, but how and why. In sun-starved Central Asia, for example, scientists have discovered that mutations in genes selecting for lighter skin would have been advantageous compared to our ancestral darker skin. Lighter skin allows in more sunlight, 
to produce vitamin D. You know, we started off looking probably closer to Africans today. So Africa is the most tropical continent on Earth, and so we need natural sunscreen that comes in the form of melanin. We didn't have SPF 50, you know, 200,000 years ago. So we started off darker. As we moved into higher latitudes, we had to lose some of that pigmentation because we have to allow a little bit of ultraviolet light down to the deeper layers of our skin so we can biosynthesize vitamin D. In Europe, blonde hair and blue eyes likely arose from random genetic mutations, then spread far and wide due to sexual selection. Probably they were unusual phenotypes. It's more widespread than it should be if it were simply neutral, so it's probably been subject to some form of selection. Doesn't seem to provide any kind of adaptive environmental advantage, so probably it was on the basis of gentlemen preferring blondes, perhaps. Recently, scientists discovered a new source of genes that are revealing surprising secrets about our past. New techniques for extracting gene material from ancient bones and teeth showed that some of our ancestors, the Neanderthals, weren't even human. The Neanderthal genome was a real tour de force. Um, it was a major technical shift in our ability to sequence ancient DNA, and it revealed this new insight into the fact that modern humans living outside of Africa had not only met the Neanderthals, we'd had fertile offspring and, you know, 2% of the genomes of, of non-Africans today trace back to Neanderthals. Turns out the Neanderthal genes are more than just trivial artifacts in our genomes. They may have played an important role in fast-tracking our evolution by improving our physiology, our immune responses, for example. And it kind of makes sense because if you think about us as an African species, they came out of Africa very recently, we're exploding around the world, new environments, new pathogens. Neanderthals had been out there for hundreds of thousands of years, adapting biologically. So it makes sense to kind of cherry pick the parts of the genome that gave us an advantage from these guys who had adapted biologically. As our globetrotting ancestors traveled out of Africa into Asia, they mixed with and benefited from another group of early humans, the Denisovans, whose genome was sequenced in 2012. The evidence lies in modern day Tibetans. It's been long known that Tibetans living in high elevations produce more oxygen carrying red blood cells than other populations. A handy adaptation for surviving in altitudes with less oxygen. And so, you know, this ability to have more red blood cells is what allows you to survive in a place that has less oxygen. Your blood is, is better able to carry the oxygen around. The ability stems from a mutation in a gene called EPAS1, which helps determine red blood cell count. But it appears the initial change did not arise in humans. This was a mutation in a gene that's part of that whole physiological pathway, but it seems to have actually come into the Tibetans from the Denisovans. So some of those things seem to have come in from these, these cousin species and been retained because they do something good for us. Perhaps some of the most illuminating findings to emerge from ancient DNA surround one of the most revolutionary developments in the history of our species the shift to farming around 10,000 years ago. We know that that shift happened initially in a few places around the world at roughly the same time. Wheat and barley in the Middle East. Rice in Asia. Corn in Mesoamerica. Potatoes in Peru. Massive shift in culture absolutely revolutionary. In fact, it has been called the Neolithic Revolution by archaeologists. But while archaeology tells us where and when the Neolithic Revolution occurred, how it spread has remained a mystery. Was it simply that the hunter-gatherers living over here saw, hey, those guys have a lot of food, maybe we should try that out? Was it a cultural shift, or was it literally the migration of farmers into places like Europe out of the Fertile Crescent? Once again, Enter DNA. So we've actually been able to take what is in effect a transect, an archaeological transect through time, and 
analyze the genomes of people before and after the transition and see that, yes, we actually did have the migration of humans into Europe, let's say Central Europe, from the Middle East, spreading farming with them. It wasn't simply the migration of a culture. It was literally the movement of people and a replacement of people who were there before. And DNA studies reveal our bodies didn't stop adapting once we settled down. Take our ability to digest milk, for example. All babies can digest milk's primary sugar, lactose. But that's not true of most adults. Kind of the default state for humans is lactose intolerance. So adults in most societies around the world are not capable of digesting milk, even though they could as children. That is, unless your ancestors were among the dairy farmers from Europe or the Middle East. In societies that domesticated animals, particularly cattle, sheep, goats that provide milk, they seem to have adapted within the last 8,000 years or so to this shift in the culture and ultimately in their diet, such that you know there was a single mutation that occurred in European populations that gave people the ability to digest milk into adulthood. The rich new source of calories and protein gave people with this mutation an extraordinary advantage, allowing them to thrive on milk and milk products from their domesticated livestock. Lo and behold, they were healthier and they had more kids, and over time, that trait spread. So it was the people who had that mutation that managed to survive. That's the way selection works. Even without the genetic adaptations, Farming in general caused human populations to soar the world over, from just a few million people a couple of thousand years ago to over seven billion today. It's very easy to grow a farming population. If you, you know, have more children, you simply plant more crops. And in fact, that leads to a natural expansion in territory and you know, encourages you to have even more children. That's not to say farming necessarily made us healthier than our hunter-gathering ways. I, I think that most people would imagine the life of a hunter-gatherer to be nasty, brutish, and short, when in fact hunter-gatherers were relatively healthy, um, very robust, and very tall. Some seven inches taller on average than Neolithic farmers living through the transition in the same regions. Hunter-gatherer bones and teeth were stronger, and they lived longer too, assuming they weren't bludgeoned to death. So all of these metrics suggesting that that radical shift in lifestyle was not good for us physiologically. So you have to ask, if it was so maladaptive, why did it win out? And the answer is because you can have lots of kids. You know, you've got a source of calories, you have a family of 10 or 15 kids, which a hunter-gatherer would never choose to do. They actually are very good at controlling their population size. But farmers can, you know, have as many kids as they want because you just plant more crops. And in fact, the kids can work the fields. So there's this feedback loop. While hunter-gatherers face traumas from hunting or warfare as their leading cause of death, for the first farmers, it was communicable diseases, mostly from their new neighbors farm animals. So this is actually a fascinating statistic. We did not get back to the hunter-gatherer um, longevity until the latter part of the 19th century. Back when the germ theory of disease was introduced. The average factory worker living in Victorian London had the same lifespan roughly as an early Neolithic farmer living 10,000 years before. So it's kind of kind of crazy. You know, you're talking people who are dying at the age of 35 or 40 on average. Even today, Wells believes our bodies are still struggling to catch up. You know, we haven't completely adapted to the shift in diet that we undertook during the Neolithic, the shift to, you know, largely carbohydrate sources of calories. You know, if you go back and look at the diet of hunter-gatherers living in the Middle East prior to the Neolithic transition. They're utilizing over 150 different plant species and they're hunting tons of different species of wild game. And today, you know, around the world, 70%, 65, 70% of the calories that are consumed come from three species of grass. So wheat and rice and corn. That's a rather radical shift in our diet. 
That was not that long ago in terms of number of generations, a few hundred generations. And some have argued that some of the diseases we see today, whether you know it's diabetes, obesity, the idea that high-carb diets may predispose to some of these things, that may be a reflection of this kind of mismatch between our ancient hunter-gatherer biology and the new culture and the new way of eating that we've created, particularly high-carb calories. And, you know, the, the biology just isn't there to deal with it yet. Yet. As much as DNA has revolutionized our understanding of where we've come from and how we've changed, more and more, it's also helping us to shape, rather consciously, where we're headed. But I think for the most part, studying the genetics is going to reveal something about the biochemical and physiological basis for the disease. That's the hope. Nowadays, off-the-shelf genetic testing kits are a billion-dollar industry, not only detailing consumers' genetic ancestries, but their susceptibility to certain diseases and what they might be able to do about them. Already, an increasing number of drugs and treatments are tailored to our DNA. That's the vision that I have for, you know, personalized medicine. Um, is, you know, you, you don't wait around for something bad to happen and then treat it. You had it off at the pass. You know that this is coming. This is a possibility based on your genetic profile, your lifestyle, what you already know about your family history. You know that in order to avoid it, you should, you know, exercise in this way or you should take this drug for prophylactic reasons, a statin or whatever it might be. Um, that's a much smarter way of practicing medicine. The next revolutionary step will be preventing hereditary diseases from arising at all. Currently through a technique called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD, parents who opt to get pregnant through in vitro fertilization can screen for genetic defects in their embryos, selecting only healthy ones to implant. They can even select for social traits like sex and eye color. Recent lab experiments are even taking that one step further. Using a gene editing technique called CRISPR, researchers were able to cure diseased embryos altogether, cutting out the diseased sections of DNA linked to a common heart disorder and replacing them with healthy versions of the gene. I think that's gonna be the greatest utility. And so in terms of health, I see in the future, every child will have its genome sequence probably at birth, possibly before birth. And you know, you will make use of this information, not simply to tell you about diseases, that's the kind of scary stuff that nobody really likes, but to help you lead a healthier life. So to help you avoid getting sick, that's the real vision. Of course, as with any new technology, there are risks involved. These new techniques will allow humans to drive and accelerate human evolution like never before. And Wells believes we, as a society, need to become informed enough about the issues to determine where to draw the line. The worry for me is that people are going to choose the same sets of characteristics and will lose diversity. And diversity, particularly genetic diversity, is really important. You know, we think that we're beyond the era of, you know, some nasty communicable disease rearing its head and, you know, wiping out a third or a half of humanity. But, you know, Ebola, Zika, it's, it's happening all the time and it's gonna happen again. What allows us as a species to survive those events that will come up in the future and have come up throughout our history as a species is maintaining enough genetic diversity to have people who are resistant to that. Whether selecting for physical traits or athleticism, intelligence, or simply lives free from disease, all of these outcomes will have major societal consequences. What do you select against? That's the scary part. And that's where we need a scientifically literate public to be engaged in this debate and helping to make these decisions. It can't just be left up to the scientists. Assuming we rise to meet these challenges, Wells remains optimistic about the future of genetic technology and our species. You know, th there are people who end up with genetic diseases who maybe that could have been avoided. 
And to that extent, it's sort of like personalized medicine. I think it's going to provide, you know, a huge improvement in our standard of living. I really do. I mean, I, I see this as being something that, that really is going to make people happier, healthier, and live longer. Now, with everything from genetic engineering and genetic tests to precision medicine and selective prenatal screenings at our disposal, streamlining evolution to improve life may not be that far off, whether we're ready for it or not.